it takes time to get to them because there's a lot of background uh, explanation and some historical facts and a lot of um, embellishments about what happened and some of the beginning does not contain the exact instruction what to do. And since this is the Buddha's greatest advantage, his teaching's greatest advantage, the exact instruction what and how to do it. I thought I'd better mention some of the things which would otherwise take quite a bit of time till we get to them in the discourse. Meditation has many methods, innumerable. People have been dreaming up new methods by the dozen in the last 20 or 30 years. The Buddha himself taught 40. And methods are just methods. That's all they are. And if we don't get away from the methods one day, we're just going to stick with the method. But we'll never have the result of the method. The result of the method is calm and insight. Calm is the means. Insight is the goal. And those two are the results of method. In Pali, Samatha and Vipassana. Therefore, Vipassana is not a method, it's a result. A result that we hopefully get. Now obviously there is perfect calm and perfect insight. And then there are all grades and stages below perfection. And hopefully we are not thinking of ourselves as having to reach perfection because that is detrimental to any practice, having to reach something. We can go step by step and gain some calm and some insight. If we stay on the breath, for even the shortest period of time. That's working towards calm. And even one moment of concentration is one moment of purification. And that's what the whole spiritual teaching is all about, purification. If we stay on the breath longer, obviously, we will eventually go to the various steps and stages of calm, of samatha. The eighth step on the Noble Eightfold Path is sama samadhi, right concentration, and that means calm. It is synonymous. But it's only a means, a means towards an end. And the end is, of course, perfect insight, but in our case, as much insight as we can gain with whatever calm we have gained, with whatever understanding we have already. So we must take some steps to also generate insight. It is not in accordance with the Buddha's dispensation to do only one, neither one, only insight or only calm. The Buddha's teaching is calm and insight, samatha and vipassana, or samadhi and panya. The three steps of the whole of the teaching, 
the three divisions, I should say, of the whole of the teaching are sila, samadhi, and panya, moral conduct, concentration, and wisdom. Wisdom is another word for insight. So with that, we can probably see already that both are required. Have to practice both. And it is usually the case that one practices on both levels, neither trying to attain perfection in one and then doing the other, nor the other one, but on both levels. So when we stay on the breath for any length of time, we're working towards calm. When we label our distracting thoughts, if they're really distracting, we're working towards insight because we get to know ourselves. Insight is also a very good word in English because it is to be seen within. Insight is within ourselves. But there are other means of gaining insight which also need to be used and practiced in a retreat such as this because this is the most favorable time for practicing because of our removal from the worldly conditions to a great extent. And one of the means of gaining insight is contemplation. Contemplation is only for insight. Now, contemplation differs from meditation in a very significant way. Meditation tries to keep the mind on the meditation subject so that it bec the mind becomes more and more one-pointed so that eventually it no longer needs the meditation subject but reverts to first sensations, then emotions, then complete quiet and then finally transcending consciousness which we will talk about in the course of this teaching. That's the path that we get in meditation. It would be unfortunate if we would have to stay watching the breath for the rest of this life. The breath isn't that interesting. And besides, we know very well how to breathe. It's nothing new. It's nothing but a method and a very effective one because breath and mind are intrinsically connected. When the mind becomes quiet, the breath becomes quiet too. And when the breath becomes very quiet, then we are nearing the first step of meditative absorption. Contemplation differs from all that by taking a subject which is universally true but has application to us individually. In other words, a statement. A statement which holds true for the whole of the universe but which we need to refer to from our own experience and standpoint. And for that, in my courses, I usually use what are called the five daily recollections. And because most of you have just gone through the course and know them, I will just repeat them here now and if you can't remember them we can also write them down and put the piece of paper on our famous table there in the dining room which is getting full of papers and it concerns our own decay, disease and death and that all that is mine, dear and delightful, must change and vanish. Now these are four ways 
of describing impermanence. So we can use one word for the whole thing, which is impermanence. But the word impermanence in Buddhist teaching is terribly overused. In the end, everybody nods their head and says, yes, everything's impermanent, I know. And that doesn't have the slightest effect. One's got to experience it within as a feeling. And therefore, contemplation helps us to do that. If we, for instance, look at our own decay as we are experiencing it physically, if we visualize our own death as we can imagine it and since it is something that will undoubtedly happen it's just a matter of imagining it how it will happen and also remembering that everything that we've ever had and called mine thoughts, feelings, sensations, experiences, people, things, objects all of that has changed or vanished. How do I relate to that? Looking at one's own decay, looking at one's own death, looking at the non-ownership of all the things we think are mine, how do I relate? Our own reaction. Contemplation is geared towards our own reaction. Now if our own reaction is one of saying, it doesn't interest me, that means we've got to get in there again because it means we don't want to know about it. Then we are quite in line with most of humanity. We're trying not to know impermanence, but try to make ourselves stable, stationary, static, ourselves and everything around us. Because this isn't possible, because nothing is stable, stationary, and static in the whole of the universe, we are constantly under pressure to accomplish something which is impossible to accomplish. And this pressure is then called stress, and we put the blame on all sorts of outside conditions. None of it is true. The outside conditions are just time-consuming. But the stress is self-induced. We're trying to make something happening which cannot happen. Nothing can remain stable and static and stationary and solid and has substance. So when we do contemplation, and I'm explaining this because I'd like you to do that during the day, to contemplate impermanence as it relates to your own breath, thoughts, feelings, sensations, to the body as it is now and used to be, to everything you've ever called mine, including nature around you, which shows impermanence also very vividly. There are dead leaves and there are growing leaves, there are those that have come to fruition, there are, there's constant movement in the life of all the plants around us. The heat changes into cold, the day into night, the sun into moon. The movement of the earth is imperceptible and yet everything looks different from day to night. We don't feel the movement. The movement of the body is imperceptible and yet it ages from second to second, from millisecond to millisecond. We don't notice it because our mindfulness is not strong enough. And yet it looks quite differently from the time it was four or six or eleven or twenty-one. It looks totally different. So what happened? Some magic happened. But it isn't magic. It's a law of nature. That's all it is. And we are constantly trying to buck the laws of nature. And that's why humanity is in the fix it's in. 
And if it's not going to get itself out of this fix, the fix is going to get worse and worse. The laws of nature are, and we are part of it, but we're trying to pretend that they don't exist. Constantly, in all aspects, all around us, within us, with us, with everything that we know. Laws of nature mean everything is fluid. Constant fluidity, constant change. The whole universe is constantly contracting and expanding. There's not anything static anywhere. And yet we're always looking for it. And because we can't find it, we pretend it's within us. Contemplation is an essential part of the spiritual path, an adjunct to meditation, because it helps us to gain insight into the characteristics of universal existence. And a little insight brings a little calm, and a little calm brings a little insight. The two always work together, and we have to practice on both levels so that we can go ahead on both levels that are necessary for our own growth. You can choose for impermanence, anything that is within you or outside of you, but always coming back to yourself. You can choose any part of yourself. You can choose decay, death, ownership. You can choose whatever is happening within you. The first four of the five daily recollections all concern impermanence. And the fifth one concerns karma and because karma is the subject of the discourse the Samanapala Sutta as it continues now I'm not going to discuss it but discuss it while I'm uh, explaining this particular Sutta contemplation is also one pointed but it puts the attention on the personal reaction. Now when the personal reaction is resisting and rejecting, then we know from that that we like to make everything stable. If the personal reaction is, I know all that, then we can know that we haven't paid enough attention. Because if we know all that, we're enlightened. If the personal reaction is, well, that's all right, so it's impermanent, doesn't matter, then we haven't really seen how we feel about it. The personal reaction has to come to the point where we can feel ourselves through it, where we can lose this sense of this stable interior substance which is the one that's referring to everything. There is no such thing. And in order to get to that, it is helpful to investigate whether there's anything found within oneself which is not impermanent. To search. Obviously, the thoughts are impermanent and the feelings and the sensations and the body and the breath all of that I mean everybody knows this so now try and find something within that is permanent that never changes that's unchanging and when you find that whatever it may be investigate that because impermanent is actually a movement fluidity and that we can feel. And when you can feel that without that background noise which says, but there's got to be something, which is me. That's a background noise in the back. Where is it? I've got to have it. When you can find the fluidity, feel the fluidity, without that background noise, then impermanence has become real. It's a contemplation 
exercise, practice, which you can do any time at all. One of the things about impermanence is also that if the mind should have its off day, all minds have off days when they can't concentrate. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too early, it's too late, I'm too full, I'm too empty, it's too noisy, it's too quiet, and so on and so on, whatever it may be. That is the time not to try to become calm, but to try to gain insight. Because for insight it can be hot, it can be cold, it can be noisy, it doesn't matter. Because the mind is trying to investigate something. So that's the time that when one sits in meditation and the mind just doesn't want to focus and become solidified, that's the time to watch the impermanence of the breath. Every single breath starts, has a middle, and finishes. And the next breath starts, middle, finish. In and out. And because it's continuous, we have the mistaken view that it's always there. But in reality, it's constantly renewed. The old one finished and a new one comes. Continuity hides impermanence. Because we have a memory of ourselves going back to age four, three, two, whatever, we think, that's me. But that that me, which was two, has absolutely no similarity to the me that may be 30, 40, 50 or whatever, we forget. Continuity hides impermanence. Watch the impermanence of the breath. And come to the understanding that our life depends upon a totally impermanent bit of air which constantly has to be renewed. And should it stop being renewed for a very short period of time, we're dead. Now have a look at that and see where that leaves us. Maybe it takes away a little bit of the substance and solid idea of me. And maybe it takes away a little bit of me importance and maybe it takes away or shakes a little bit the rug that we try to hang on to which is supposed to give us safety and security let the breath stop for a minute and a half or two and all safety and security is gone watch it become aware of it don't reject it don't resist it don't think oh well I don't really want to know. But see it. See it for what it is. Because only if we see things as they really are will we get nearer absolute truth and be able to shed our burdens. In the beginning, when insight hasn't been established yet, it appears, or let's say little insight has been established, it appears as if knowing these things it's an extra burden. It's just the other way around. Understanding this takes away all the burden. And there's nothing anymore to worry about. It's in constant flux anyway. Which moment does one want to worry about? This one? The last one? The next one? They're all going? Gone. All gone. Nothing at all to hang on to. And that's why people who habitually worry have an awfully hard time with it. Because what are they going to worry about? They're going to have to make it up. Because reality is constantly moving. So contemplation helps us greatly in gaining some insight into ourselves. And if the mind is very distracted, it's very helpful to use even the meditation for gaining insight into impermanence as far as the breath is concerned, as far as the thoughts are concerned, how they come and go. And as in 
sort of bottom line, check out what is there in me that's permanent. And if you like to give it a name, give it some name. And then after having given it a name, investigate it. What is it? How does it feel? What does it uh, do? How does it act? Whatever it is. Find it. If you can't find it, well, maybe there'll be some other conclusions. Contemplation must bring results in, eventually, in one's own assessment, understanding, and finally feeling about oneself. The whole of this path while it has to be understood first, goes to feeling. We all feel that we're me. Everybody knows who gets out of bed in the morning. Me, of course. Who else? It's my bed, my pajamas, so it must be me. <laughs> Same is with enlightenment. The person who's enlightened, enlightened knows has that feeling. No me. It's all feeling. But first it has to be understood. And that's the only way we can communicate. We communicate on the understanding level. Then the practice has to come. Well, there's a space in between. One has to remember. One has to remember the information and remember to practice. And then, after the practice, eventually, Again, first comes the understanding, and then the feeling. The feeling is the last thing that comes, and that's then the result of it. So I wanted to make that clear, to use contemplation also in your daily um, practice here. Now, are there any questions about that, or anything else? especially possibly questions by those who have not been in a course with me before, of which there are only a few, um, and therefore I may not have done this kind of contemplation before, but anyone, whatever. Or is it quite clear what to do? Or is it so unclear that there are no questions? <laughs> Did you have a hand up? Mm. Did you have your hand up? It's so unclear. Oh, I don't know what's happening. Do you mean, um, does this, should this be done like meditation with the eyes closed? Contemplation? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Certainly. And you can choose whatever you want to, to Well, as long as it refers to impermanence. It has to be something which is universally true. Well, decay, disease, and death are universally true. And uh, change, impermanence, fluidity is also universally true. So it has to be universally true, and you must be able to relate to it then individually. Well, uh, yes. Well, are you aware of the fact that you're decaying? Well, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> check it out. <laughs> check it out whether you are or you aren't. Then you look at the feeling of aversion, then realize that you obviously don't like the truth. So go right ahead and check it out again. <laughs> you see, the Buddhist uh, um, path has come only as a means. And that was his reform movement in Brahminical India because the uh, Brahminism, which was it was then called a not Hinduism, 
is the same as what's now Hinduism, uh, was concerned with um, calm and uh, samadhi and uh, no interest in insight. But since samadhi is also impermanent, the Buddha's reform movement, innovation, and uh, spiritual renewal was the insight into the three characteristics of the universe. And we will go through them step by step, the insight. We have enough time for all of that. But I wanted to put the contemplation ahead of time so that you can use it. It's um, essential that the practice is being done. And if you have a version, as you just said, against the fact of decay and would rather that it didn't happen, well, look at it again. Have you ever heard of anybody who hasn't had it happen to them? Look at it. Check it all out. It should be very revealing. <laughs> yes? So, again, you only use contemplation when you're at, at times when your concentration isn't good, if your concentration no. is good, stay on the breath? In meditation, yes. In meditation, if your concentration is good, go towards calm. In meditation, if your concentration is not good, then watch the impermanence of the breath. But contemplation, outside of meditation and outside of the, possibly even outside of the meditation hall, do it every day. Every single day. Never let a day go by. That's why the Buddha called it the five daily recollections. I'm of the nature to decay. I'm of the nature to be diseased. I'm of the nature to die. All that is mine, dear and delightful, will change and vanish. And the fifth one is karma, which I'll discuss later. Every single day do contemplation. You can do it in the uh, meditation hall, you can sit on a bench, you can uh, <coughs> sit on somewhere on a chair, you can wherever you like, but yes, it's also done with closed eyes so that you don't get distracted because you have to be also one-pointed, but on the subject. Is that clear? Okay. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking about our teaching, the teaching angle on the whole thing. Uh, that is, if the teacher proposes something that is totally unpalatable to the student, the student will simply not do it. They may pretend that they are meek, but uh, they will just shy away from it. It's like a horse will shy away if you handle it in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Now. I come from a Christian background where this business is you almost die was just like the subtenor of my whole religious upbringing. When I got to be a teenager, I just thought I want no more of that fall out of work. And so I started looking around for things that are just a little more uh, life reflecting. You know, to me, all it was death reflecting. But in a, in a depressing way, it didn't give me any, let me call this insight, although I don't mean your, the insight that you're proposing here that you're teaching. Uh, it just made me depressed. And I didn't think that was a very, very uh, positive thing. Now, I've noticed that when I talk about things like this to people who I consider to be like people off the street, Average persons, good persons, but average persons who are not into, let's say, spiritual training. And I, I find that not with a ten foot pole do they want to touch this. Now, the Buddha really proposed to get out of suffering, let's say, in an efficient <coughs> way. You know, he says, you can all see that there's suffering, uh, you have all tried to get out of it. Um, but none of you has succeeded, right? And probably the students would say, right, none of us succeeded. Now let me propose this thing, you know, basically. Let's see if, if this works, getting out of something mm -hmm. this way. Um, if I tell somebody to get out of suffering, but it is involved with this, quote, negative death contemplation, 
I will probably just make the person shy away. Uh, and I'm wondering what you have to, uh, what you have to propose. Well, what I would propose is that you first get in touch with it yourself before you mention it to anybody else. And then when you mention it, you will be able to mention it correctly. First, you have to be able to do it yourself. Because only who loses his life will find complete life. There's no difference between the teaching in Christianity and the teaching of the Buddha if it was seen correctly. Once there's no fear, you can live. But until your own death is totally accepted and expected and seen as the natural culmination of having been alive and there is not the slightest feeling of rejection until then life is always imbued with fear and because of that fear it is never free there is always dukkha so before you mention this to anyone please do it yourself and find the relief and the release it gives once death has been completely seen and completely accepted because only when you accept the laws of nature as your own laws can you flow with them and as we flow with them we don't have any blockages and life becomes very easy and very harmonious so please don't mention it to anybody well that was partially the position that I made uh, last week you gave me a very interesting hint when you said uh, when you walk outside you point out the window and uh, just take a look at how everything is changing and that seemed to be just clicking something when I went outside, I watched everything off. I have been working with nature. I grew up on a farm, and since then I've been doing gardening and so on. So I'm quite familiar with these things. You know, mm-hmm. the food change, temperature, I'm changing it too. Mm-hmm. It's changing itself, and the seasons and all that. Uh, the effect of this business watching nature change and then seeing yourself in that as part of nature, it being a natural thing, I thought. Uh, the result of that made my the corners of my mouth go up. And when I remember in my early upbringing, it made the corners of my mouth go down. So there's really a significant difference. And if the student could be given a hint of that possibility, then maybe he or she wouldn't reject this business that doesn't change so much or suffer anymore. Well, I'm of the opinion, I may be totally wrong, but I'm of the opinion that I'm giving more than hints. I'm constantly... Uh, putting it down and not only as hints but as facts <laughs> all I'm asking you is to check them out yourself check it all out yourself and you cannot tell these people the, uh, to tell these things to people who have no interest in spiritual practice and the reason why that it's so often rejected when you hear it in the Christian context is because it is being not being taught is it not being taught as a contemplation for yourself? It's being, it's being told, told as just something that should be regarded as some sad fact. It's not a sad fact. It all leads to one only result. Losing the ego illusion. The ego illusion cannot stand up under the insight. So one inside after another, little by little by little. And as we accept one thing after another and see it for what it is, nothing but the natural flow of the whole universal existence, then resistance and rejection disappear. What are we resisting and rejecting? The fact that we, me, isn't going to be here anymore. Well, so what? Me is not going to be here anymore one day. It's a fact. It's a law of nature. It's absolutely guaranteed. So, people have made up all sorts of stories about how me could remain around and ideas how it's possible, you know, where we could sit in paradise 
and where we could have a nice chair to the right of right hand of God or left hand of God or something like that and get written up in the St. Peter's book with some good results. All sorts of fairy tales. Check them out. See how, how much you can verify. The Buddha said not to believe anything he said, just to have enough confidence to check it all out yourself. That's all. Just check it out. And I mean, death is very easy to check out. There isn't anyone ever born who hasn't met with that fate. So it's very easy to check that one out. Nothing could be easier. But then you have to live with that. And that's where the resistance comes in and the rejection. I'd rather have it differently. It just isn't differently. It's just the way it is. Seeing things as they really are, the knowledge and vision of things as they really are, is one of the steps on the inside path and will eventually get to that in this sutta because it's a fairly far advanced step. But I felt <coughs> compelled to tell you about contemplation, whether it's going to bring you any insight or not, because it is necessary to practice it so that when we do come to these insight steps, which will be part of this sutta, that they are already uh, sounding a little more familiar, that it's not such a big jump from maybe nothing to being part of this birth and death. All that arises has to cease. Watch the breath. When it has arisen, it must cease. That's the inside part. Is that clear? Hopefully. <laughs> Maybe clear, but not, not, not the way you'd like it, huh? <laughs> yeah, is it clear? Is there any question remaining? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I have really no problem with that personally. Well, she's good to talk with. <laughs> but, um, but you know people who have problems practice, with that. Quite seriously, in this practice, one day you think you have licked it, you maybe you think of it more than 10 days, 10 minutes long. But then it's gone again, and you need to really almost like start over everything again. So then the accumulation of these efforts, I suppose, is what will become a kind of like a second, like an orphan mm. ego almost, and using it in a different way, that you just swim in it, you just sort of float in it, it becomes like background to you. You feel it. Rather than yeah. effort, rather than constantly saying, oh, I need to remind myself that everything is a problem, you know, just sort of mm. becomes... That comes like eventually, problem. that comes eventually. Uh, when things happen which you don't want to happen, and they don't have any sting. You see them permanent. They have no sting whatsoever. But you don't want, they are not the things you want to happen. They are happening anyway. That's the result of seeing them permanent. Then you know. You think, huh. But you're quite right. When it becomes, comes naturally and you're flowing with it, then it's, then it has done it. Anything else? Well, we got as far as where the Buddha said to the king, ask whatever you wish to, great king. And there's quite an explanation about that too. When the king heard that, he thought, Oh, how wonderful is the Buddha. I have committed such crimes towards him. I have killed his chief supporter, King Bimbisara, his father. I have accepted the request of Devadatta and sent assassins, these soldiers with bow and arrow, to kill him. I released the elephant Nalagiri against him, and with my support Devadatta hurled a stone at him. 
The Buddha should not even open his mouth towards such a criminal, criminal as myself, yet he freely addresses me. He is well established in the characteristic of a stable one in five modes. Primarily, the five modes means equanimity towards pleasure and pain. Well, maybe I'll explain that rather than go, I won't get very far with this sutta anyway today. I'll explain the, the equanimity towards pleasure and pain. Some of the things which I'm, I have mentioned in the uh, seven-day course we've just had, so some of that will be familiar to you. Those of you who remember it exactly, please have patience and compassion towards the others who haven't heard it. And if you have heard it and forgotten half of it, so then it's good to hear it again. Equanimity towards pleasure and pain concerns the five noble powers. They're called Arya Idis. And these are five of the 37 factors of enlightenment when they have become perfected. Naturally, we practice these things in order to gain perfection. We must never think that we need already to be perfected. This would uh, entail becoming dissatisfied with ourselves. All we need to recognize and realize is that we need to practice. We need to actually put our mind in that direction. So the Arya Idis are actually another one of the Buddha's word plays on the word Idi or Siddhi in Sanskrit which is very um, well known and in those days and even today as supernormal powers, you know, like uh, walking through walls or um, uh, raising oneself up from one's seat and these sort of things, which were very much en vogue in India in those days and still have a great following in India today. And uh, the Buddha said, no, these are not the noble powers. The noble powers are something entirely different. And in Pali, the word idi is the same as in Sanskrit, the word siddhi. The noble powers are to see the non-delightful in the delightful and to see the delightful in the non-delightful. To see the delightful in the non-delightful and delightful, and to see the non-delightful in the delightful and non-delightful, and for the arahant fully enlightened, to see neither in any of it. Which means that If there is something that we find most attractive and we want it, whether it is a person or an object or an experience, whatever it may be that we are craving for, and we really put all our intention on getting that, then we can immediately see that that too is impermanent, whatever it may be. If it's an object, it will break and will have to be repaired. It will get dirty and will have to be cleaned. It will dissolve and will have to be replaced. If it's very valuable, it has to be looked after and insured. It has to be locked up. We have to do everything we can in order to keep it. Its impermanence cannot be stopped. And the same for a person. So that we can see that there is in that delight that we have in that object or person also that which is not 
delightful. And when we have dislike towards somebody or something, because we find that thing objectionable or that person, then to immediately remember the good things about it, the helpfulness, the generosity, the uh, in a, another person that the other person is also having dukkha, or that the thing which we find so objectionable may be quite useful to another person or is also part of nature. Whichever way we can make it balance, the whole of the teaching constantly is geared towards balancing so that we get into balance. Well, we are all out of balance. We are all extreme. Either we have extreme ideas of our own worth or we have extreme ideas of our own non-worth. Very few people ever find a balance. Most people change from one extreme to the other rapidly within 10 minutes or 5 minutes or from one day to the next. But this is this balancing act. Also, our own death is a balancing act because the Buddha said we're all infatuated with life. These are all balancing acts. So that here we have this balancing act which then goes on as a repetition. The Buddha's teaching is often repetitious because he knows very well, he knew very well that we're not listening very well that we goes in one ear and out the other. So he repeated himself, I would say always, whatever he taught, he repeated it in the hope that it would sink in the second time around. Very often he repeated it three times. We find suttas where the things are repeated six, seven, eight, nine, and ten times. Whether he really did that or not is impossible to say now. It may have become so repetitious through the uh, constant um, oral transmission. But here he repeats himself and he says, now see the delightful in both, in that what you like and that what you don't like. See the good things on all, all angles and then see the bad on both sides also so that you're always in balance, so that you're always seeing both sides in everything whether it's people, or whether it's things, or whether it's experiences, or whether it's that what you're craving for, or whether that's what you're rejecting. Always see both, on both, ang on both sides. And then the fifth one is the Arahant fully enlightened, who needn't practice that anymore because he has, as it said here, equanimity towards pain and pleasure, even-mindedness. That too will change. It has arisen, so it will cease. It doesn't have any personal connotation. It isn't meant personally, because there isn't anybody there that it could be meant to or for personally. It just is. And so the Arahant doesn't have to um, relate to the delightful and the non-delightful. He just sees it away with equanimity in both instances. But for us, this kind of practice should be extremely valuable in case of hate and in case of greed, which are our two enemies. So whenever one of them arises, we can try and balance it by seeing the good in one case and by seeing the bad in the other. And then we have a far more balanced view now, none of this should go overboard. We should not then, after having seen the non-delightful and the delightful, become um, rejecting of that. Then we'll have to do the opposite again, get it back into the middle. These are called the five uh, noble powers, five Arya Idis, and as so many times, it's a word play of the Buddha on something which was well known in India in those days and is still today being practiced and sometimes even brought to the West where one can uh, learn to um, 
do things which are supposedly supernormal powers. The Buddha was very much against supernormal powers only for Arahants. He said that otherwise one gets off the path. So any question about any of that? So what we are re reading here is that poor Ayata Sattu has a terribly bad conscience, as he should have. If one uh, kills one's own father, one should have a terribly bad conscience. And he not only has killed his own father, but he was also instrumental in helping Devadatta trying to kill the Buddha. Now that was never successful, as I've already told um, and recounted that he tried three times, but he was never successful. Devadatta was actually the perpetrator, but Ayatasattu was his uh, helper. So he thinks it's wonderful that the Buddha is even talking to him. So he must have now, by this time, have a quite an uh, exact idea of the uh, crime he has committed. In other words, he's not uh, um, just uh, thinking that it's something he should do, but he uh, has great remorse. So he's, um, he says, uh, I should not abandon such a teacher and search for a teacher elsewhere. So he's filled with joy and is addressing the Buddha. Now because the Buddha knows that the king wants to ask questions, he says to him, ask whatever you wish to, great king. And he invites him to ask. It's no trouble for me. I will answer everything. Now this is an uncommon invitation, it says in the Sutta, and most teachers do not invite the, uh, the listeners to ask any questions. This is a particular feature of the Buddha because he wanted people to be investigating and understanding everything on their own. Now then the king asked his question. King Ayatasattu paid homage to the Exalted One, saluted the company of bhikkhus, sat down to one side and said to the Exalted One, Venerable Sir, I would like to ask the Exalted One about a certain point, if he would take the time to answer my question. So then the Buddha says, ask whatever you wish. And now I'll read you the question, which is um, it's quite interesting in a way. There are, Venerable Sir, various crafts and now we learn the kind of jobs that people had in those days. Elephant trainers, horse trainers, charioteers, archers, standard bearers, camp marshals, commandos, high royal officers, frontline soldiers, bull warriors, military heroes, mail clad warriors, domestic slaves, confectioners, barbers, bath attendants, cooks, garland makers, laundrymen, weavers, basket makers, potters, statisticians, accountants, and various other crafts of a similar nature. Now some of these we still have today, but uh, most of them we don't. But we have a whole slew of new ones, haven't we? Computer programmers. Telephone operators. Now all those who practice these crafts enjoy here and now the visible fruits of their craft. They obtain happiness and joy themselves. They give happiness and joy to their parents, wives and children, their friends and colleagues. They establish an excellent presentation of gifts to recluses and Brahmins, leading to heaven, ripening and happiness, conducing to a heavenly rebirth. Is it possible, Venerable Sir, to point out any fruit of recluseship that is similarly visible here and now. So what the king is asking is a totally justified question. He says all these people, they have jobs and they make money having these jobs and so they can look after their parents and wives and children and give gifts to their friends and colleagues and also they can gifts to monks and recluses um, and Brahmins and priests and that those kind of gifts should lead to heaven and uh, give them a heavenly rebirth. So
So, but what does the spiritual life bring? And uh, it's not an unusual question to be asked of us nowadays. In fact, um, my own daughter said to me, well, I can understand maybe that you'd like to be a Buddhist, but why would you have to be a nun? (laughs) And uh, it's not unusual that people who have no interest or no connection to meditation would find it quite strange that one would sit for 30 days in a small room on a little pillow and uh, get knee pains and uh, get the mind distracted and worry about uh, not getting concentrated and do this day after day and they think well in the meantime in this heat they could have gone to the beach what kind of business is this (laughs) so that's what the king is asking King is saying, well, look, all these people, they're all having jobs, they all do these things, and they have quite a lot of happiness and joy with these, with these jobs they're having, so what is this with the, with the uh, spiritual part? And then before the Buddha answers him, he says to him, do you remember, great king, ever asking other recluses and Brahmins this same question? And then he says, I do remember asking them, venerable sir. And if it isn't troublesome for you, the Buddha says, please tell us how they answered. It is not troublesome for me, Venerable Sir, when the Exalted One or anyone like him is present. Then speak, Great King. So, the Buddha knows already that he has asked these other teachers, because he was asking all these ministers uh, about, you know, which teacher they are, uh, recommending and uh, he had this uh, either he knew or had an inkling that he had already asked the same question of others it's not uninteresting how the Buddha deals this, with this business of other teachers because um, during the time of the Buddha there were lots of other teachers I mean there still are but possibly even at the time of the Buddha there might have been even more because it seems that the same type of people seemed to arise at the same time. We had great painters of the Dutch and Flemish schools, all in the Renaissance, they're all sort of almost contemporaries. And then in the last century, we had a lot of the uh, um, painters that started out the new schools. They all came together, they were all at the same time. Also, some of the great... um, um, uh, great composers were all living at the same time. So it's even at, with the uh, spiritual masters, they also often several at the same time. So there were a lot of, of teachers around in the Buddhist time. So so the Buddha did not answer this um, and did not answer him directly. The fruit of the spiritual life in the Buddhist terminology is stream entry, once return and non-return and arahant, and we'll get to that later. But because the uh, king has not any, uh, any experience with any of this, the Buddha doesn't go into that at all. So he wants to first explain it to him on a much more everyday level, mundane level. And so he's not um, answering him directly, but he knows that these ministers who came along with the king were all disciples of other teachers. That he knew for sure. So that's why he's asking him, have you already asked these other teachers? And then he, he also felt that if he would point out himself the negative sides of those other teachers, then he might put off those ministers, might anger them because they were the disciples. So he didn't want to say anything. That's why he wanted the king to say it all. Because the ministers have to listen to the king no matter what he says, because he's in charge. (laughs) So that's why he's letting, letting, letting the king explain it all. So then, when the uh, Buddha asked him whether he would like to explain this, whether the king would like to explain about 
or having asked the other teachers. The king's quite happy to do that because he already has been dissatisfied with these other teachers, but he didn't want to come out with a statement like that. He didn't also didn't want to say that you know, openly. So he was quite happy to sort of uh, open his heart to the Buddha because he could feel that there would be some possibility of being understood. And then we've got six teachers and it's not uninteresting to find out all the things they're teaching and it's all about karma. So tomorrow evening we're going to have a whole hour on karma because these teachers are teaching, uh, according to the, to the Buddhist teaching, the wrong doctrine about karma. And it's not, uh, it's not so different from some of the things that we hear today. We can still hear that kind of thing too. Although Christianity is quite clear on the point of karma, as you sow, you will reap. It couldn't be simpler. And yet, there's a lot of um, confusion on that point. And as we can hear here, this confusion is not new. It's at least two and a half thousand years old because we have five teachers, not six, the six one teachers, something else. Five teachers who are all saying different things about karma. So we'll do that tomorrow. Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Think of your most beloved person and let the feeling for that most beloved person arise in your heart. Fill your heart with it. And then direct that feeling towards yourself. Let it fill you from head to toe, drench you, surround you. There's no difference between persons, you or any other. Now think of your most beloved person again. Let that feeling for that person arise. And then reach out with that same feeling to the person sitting nearest you in this room and fill him or her with the same love you have for your most beloved person.
and now extend that same feeling to everyone here. Filling everyone, surrounding everyone with the same love you have for your most beloved person. Bring up the feeling for your most beloved person again. Feel it filling your heart. And then reach out to your parents with the same feeling. Filling their hearts with that same love. Now think of those people that are closest to you, with whom you might live. Fill them all with the same love you have for your most beloved person, making no difference between people. Feel the love for your most beloved person again and then extend it to all your friends. Giving them the gift of your heart, the best you have to offer without expecting to get the same in return.
Feel the love for your most beloved person again. And reach out with that same feeling to all the people who are part of your life. Neighbors, colleagues at work, Salespeople, people you meet here and there. Do not let the love in your heart be diminished. Let it remain as strong as it is for your most beloved person and reach out with it to all these different people. Choose a person with whom you may be angry or upset, disliking, indifferent. Hold fast to the feeling that you have for your most beloved person and reach out with that to the person you find difficult. Do not allow the love in your heart to be diminished. Think of your most beloved person again. Feel the love in your heart for that person. And then let this love overflow from your heart like a stream that breaks its banks and reach out in all directions. Giving the gift of love to as many people as you can reach. Near and far, known and unknown,
Let your loving feelings reach out to all the people who are present in these buildings. in this place here. Give them the best your heart has to offer. Feel the love for your most beloved person again. Direct it inward towards yourself so that you can feel it as a foundation of your inner being. embracing and then feel the joy and contentment that comes from loving and giving and surround yourself with joy and contentment feeling quite protected at ease Let the love that you have for your most beloved person be anchored in your heart, becoming one with it, so that you can always feel it. May all beings have love in their hearts. I like to say something about noise. Noise is, of course, an enemy of meditation. But if we dislike it, resist it, wish for it to finish, or even get upset about it, we are creating even more enemies. One enemy is enough that we we get a whole army of them. Instead, we deal with it in an 
skillful way. This is one of the very often used phrases of the Buddha. Skillful means. Noise is sound. Noise is already a judgment. It's sound. And sound are airwaves. They have vibration. So when the sound is there, try not to call it noise, not to react, but let the vibration of it vibrate with your own vibration. And as you do that, even if you can only manage a little of it, you will find that it is a help for med meditation if the sound does not become too strong. When it's too strong, the vibration is too strong and it can no longer vibrate with one's own vibration. But we have constant vibration. So the sound, which also is air vibration, can vibrate together with us and then it can actually be a means of becoming concentrated. The least it can do, it can explain something to us which is extremely important on the way to insight. And insight is the goal. That the ear only hears sound. It cannot hear police car, shooting, yelling, dogs, radios, music, none of that. That's all created by the mind, every bit of it. The ear hears sound. So use that, at least that, for recognizing how we react learning the inside path through the four mental aggregates of which the first one is the sense consciousness in this case hearing we're just going to stay with hearing right now that's the first sense consciousness that we're going to discuss because it's very appropriate hearing now hearing has as a next step, as all sense consciousness have, feeling. Now obviously that feeling is created because of our mental objection. There are sounds which we would like at times. Now certainly there is some music that we might like but we mightn't like it now. We might like music when we want to hear music. We might not like it when we want to...